What's up guys? Thank you for watching this episode of the My Living Legacy vlog. As always, I'm Tyler Jack Harris. In this episode, I want to do something a little bit different. So with our business, amidst all the chaos of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic going on, uh, instead of having bi-weekly webinars, we've been having webinars every single week. And last Friday, we had the absolute honor of having Tom Shea join us for a little bit of a fireside chat just to share some of his life experience in chaotic situations. For those of you that don't know Tom Shea, a 23-year Navy SEAL, heavily decorated, and just one of the most incredible men that I've ever had the pleasure of getting to know. But in this episode, you're gonna hear him tell a story of what may be the most chaotic series of events that I've ever heard. And as I was sitting in the room listening to him tell this story, I felt like I was watching a movie play out before me. I'm really excited for you guys to experience that as well. But I wanna take this opportunity to honor Tom and acknowledge him. He's got a brand new book coming out and it's available for pre-order. It's called Three Simple Things. And never, ever, ever has there been a more important time for us to look at all the chaos going around us and boil it down to what are the three simple things that I can do to better my situation. Um, guys, I think you're gonna absolutely love this episode. Pay close attention and just enjoy and i'll cap i'll start that with what joe said in the middle there uh, every mission that you get in this especially in the seals and if you're a warrior if you're military service and you're listening you know what i'm about ready to say every mission is unwinnable they give you a tasking you're like oh my god we're gonna die the first impulse is we're outnumbered they have the high ground or whatever condition is. So every mission that you get, you know, is an unwinnable condition or mission. And you flesh it down to at least three basic things that you can do during that mission that will move the mission success forward. That paperwork that it's written on falls apart half a second after you take the first step. <laughs> and you can plan missions out for days and then the more experience you get, you know, you know it's not going to last five seconds or it's going to last until the first bullet travels. Yeah. And so with experience, you recognize that. So you're like, okay, don't everybody panic. Let's find the simplicity first, and then go practice and rehearse the simplicity, which makes it even simpler. And now let's go execute on it. And so the one of the, and we talked about this as well, one of the interesting missions that I ended up getting the Silver Star for was uh, a mission three months into a six month deployment. And up to that point in time, we'd been massively successful, which a metric of success in the teams is that you survive. <laughs> so we were really successful. I hadn't lost anybody, didn't lose anybody that whole deployment. Nobody actually, actually had an injury that was worthy of a medal. Uh, and we're there three months into it, we get tasked to go after a training camp deep into the mountains of uh, central and northern Afghanistan, yep. two hour flight, five other attempts have been made by other military units to drive there and they were summarily repelled by volume of fire. And we looked at it, think, well, it's not winnable. And my crew got down, looked at it and said, dude, all we gotta do is fly there. You get us on the ground, we'll win that battle. We knew we were outnumbered when we hit the ground, three to one. <laughs> and in the mind of a SEAL, there's, th well, I have more than three bullets in my gun, I'll take those three, so we're, oh, I got it. So our brains were like, okay, we can figure that out. So we landed four miles from the target area, deep in the mountains, between where we landed and where we were gonna go, the gap. <laughs> where we landed, where we were gonna go was 9,000 foot, 11,000 foot, back to nine and a half, back up to 11 and back down to 10. And mountainous terrain carrying an extra 100 pounds, your brain can't think about that. So notice that whatever you're going through and how you're contemplating your day-to-day -day things and whatever your life is doing right now, imagine trying to figure that out. What we knew we could do was get off the airplane and consolidate, or, or the helo. That's as far as we could figure it out. 
if we get out of the helo, consolidate three forces, we'll figure out the next step. We had a detailed plan, but we knew it wouldn't work. We get out of the helo and got rocketed three steps out of the helo. And now we're four miles from the target area in an area that they weren't supposed to be. And they were, they were shooting at us from the high ground. All we did, we didn't even shoot back because it makes things very complicated when you shoot and they shoot. If they're shooting, we know where they are. Don't overcomplicate it. And your immediate reaction is to shoot back. Mm -hmm. So we, we were a mature fighting force at that point in time. And nobody shot back without even being told because they knew it would complicate it. So we had three elements separated by like 300 yards. So under fire, we slowly crawled to each other, which was my location, with an IR beacon. So they crawled to me. It took an hour to move 300 yards under fire. Now we're all together, and we did simple things. Where is everybody? Do we have a full head count? And the head, came, head, came, head count came up very quickly. So when it's doing simple things in chaotic situations, win. So now that we knew where everybody were, we had a base element that was possibly going to shoot, and then our, my maneuver element would move first, and then they would follow us. And meanwhile, we called in a Predator and a C-130 and two Apaches to handle our complicated situation. So they took the shooting away from us. Let us get the heck out of here, keep our stuff simple while they're taking a complicated thing away. And they had sectors that they were shooting in. And meanwhile, when we're moving, the Apaches are opened up and they're firing. And the C-130 is shooting 105 rounds from way up in the sky and they're hitting within 200 yards of us. And all we're doing is moving slowly and quietly and nobody's talking because communication complicates things. Because when your brain and your body have to do something, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. When your voice opens up, it <clears throat> overcomplicates it. So what normally, in, in the plan, that four miles is supposed to take two hours, it took six hours. By the time we got there, we're all, we're all out of food and water. And we haven't shot yet. So we're out of food and water. We get 300 yards from the target and get in our first little firefight. And we knew they were there. We have C-130 with thermal looking at everything. And we're walking into a pre-existing firefight knowing that we're going to have to take out 10 guys immediately that weren't in the position that they said they were going to, we thought they were going to be. So now, well, we know how to do that. It's just another direct action, unplanned direct action. So instead of thinking about what's going to happen in two days, what's right. going to happen yesterday, and all the stuff that's going on, my lead element separated, took down those guys, beautiful scenario that we'd practice a hundred million times. Now that element is done. We move up to an overwatch position on the village that we're intentionally going to go to. And it's a, like ants everywhere, which wasn't planned for. Now it's just another easy target. It wasn't a series of difficult targets. Now it's another easy target, unplanned. The other platoon chief and I talked about it. What do you have? What do I have? Okay, this is how we're going to do it. Race, set, go. About a 40-second conversation. He separates, takes out three guys immediately. We roll in behind him, take the next building, take the next building, take the next building. After we were supposed to be done by 6 in the morning, it's now 9 in the morning, which is a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. We're unsecured at 9 in the morning. We're supposed to be secured set up for our position and defending ourselves at dawn. Now we're three hours past dawn, which militarily, like you're, you're doomed unt until you're secure. So at 9 a.m., we secure our position and had to separate forces, which is complicated. We originally wanted to maintain these buildings, couldn't do it. The reason why I'm telling the elaborate story is simplicity, chaos, simplicity, chaos. So we couldn't maintain our primary positions and we were going to stay consolidated. The ground truth, like right now, your ground truth is different than you planned two months ago. Shit. Our ground truth said if we stay here doing what we're doing, we're all going to die because the buildings that we're in, 
there was a mountaintop 100 yards away that a six-year-old with three grenades could have killed us all. So, okay, we got to separate from that position. And we moved 300 yards out into the middle of the middle of a village or the middle of a bowl with mountains around us, which is the worst tactical position you could ever take. But we couldn't leave. And we couldn't maintain the buildings that we had thought yep. of. So now we moved out there. It's 9 o'clock. We set up. We had to separate, send an element up to a ridge top about a half mile away, which basically said, you're on your own. We can't help you, and you can't, we can't fight to you up a hill. And a half mile away is like being somewhere else in the world. And when we separated from those guys, I thought I'd never see them again. Because yeah. we were still taking small fire at that point. So they go up there, they set up the hilltop. They didn't take up enough water. And at that point it was 120 degrees. So we're now in dire need of water. We did the worst thing we could do. We called for a helo to come out in our position and drop us food, water, and ammo, which now tells the element, the enemy, exactly to the letter where you are. Yep. So we're like, you know what, they know where we are, so we hung up an Israeli and American flag. Bring it. <laughs> so we're not going to hide. We're not even going to be covert. Bring it. We're here. Ours are bigger than yours. I wouldn't say that out loud. but So we knew what the condition was. We're not going to overcomplicate yeah. it by staying covert and soft and being quiet. Throughout the day, we killed probably 60 Taliban that knew where we are. Big firefights. And we got word from the boss, which is, it ain't over. Yeah, it ain't over. So he said, hey, good job, we're gonna come out in two hours. But it wasn't over for us. We dropped the ball, mentally. We were like, oh, it's over. So we stopped doing the basic stuff. We stopped defending ourselves. In a 30 minute period of time, there were 85 Taliban that moved in on us because we didn't pay attention. And how many were you? How many of you guys were there? There were uh, eight in my building. Wow. So they maneuvered in away from the hilltop out through this little valley that was leading into our building. And so we're not knowing. I took, I let my guard down, took my body armor off because, dude, we won. We won. We're, we're going we're to hike out of here. Everything's good. The mental mindset changed, but the environment did not change. And, uh, and I remember seeing, I looked up on this hilltop that I've been looking at all day, and it was probably 685 yards away and it looked like red bees flying at me. And my brain goes, that's odd. I'm like, shit, bullets. And I leaned out of the way and 30 or 40 rounds hit right where my head was. So I'm rolling away from the wall, watching these red tracer rounds follow me, which means he could see me. And I slowed down, like the world slows down and I felt like I could go fast. I remember jumping up, jumping through this window and a rocket follows me into the room, hits on the corner of the window, and I didn't hear it. It blew up, and I had just jumped into the window, and I traveled 12 feet to the back of the room and hit the wall like a spider without the ability to stay on the wall, and I landed on my back. And that was the only time that I've ever felt fear, like visceral fear, and I was crippled. And I just laying there, could hear everything, couldn't move my arms or legs. I thought, well, I must be dead. Cause I couldn't feel any pain. I thought, ah, oh, it must be the last three seconds of it all. And I was saying to myself, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And my body agreed with me. And I couldn't do simple, simple anything. I remember seeing a bullet like rotating like a top right in front of me going, oh, dude, that's pretty cool. And the only thing that got me up was all of a sudden I started being able to move, but I couldn't actually get up. I'm like, you know what? What I can do is I can get up now. So that's the first simple thing that I did. Mm -hmm. Get up now. So I got up. I went over to my, the corner where my gun and my body armor, my head, my helmet was. I put it on. I'm like, okay, I, let me now figure out the second simple thing. Where are all my men? So I turned my radio on, 
to the wrong channel, which is funny. I just quickly turned it to the wrong channel. I'm calling out and nobody's answering. I was like, oh, I'm dead. And I remember standing there in the room, unable to move. Like, dang, I don't want to be a lone survivor. And I couldn't do anything. I couldn't get my body and my mind to even process anything. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to move over to the window and I want to see where the enemy is, which is to me another offensive thing. So I did another offensive thing. Moved up to the window, poked my head out, and a bullet hit half an inch from my eye on the window frame. I'm like, oh my God. So I went into the room and under the window. I pushed this thing up so he could see it, and he shoots right through the middle of it. I'm like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden, what shifted for me was I'm under fire. I know exactly what to do. Hmm. And I started processing that mentally going, there's no way he's a better sniper than me. Because he could only be on that hilltop, which means he had glass on his gun. Sure. I'm like, okay. So I, sniper on sniper, I'm gonna get him. And all of a sudden my body relaxed. I was able to do everything I was trained to do. I pulled a blanket over my head. I'm crawling in the room. I get up to where I can see the right side of the hill. I'm looking at it, see the top of the hill, still haven't seen him. And if I move a half an inch more out into the, to see further, the light that was coming through the window was, was going to see, was going to expose me. So I took all the slack out of my trigger and moved out there. I see his head, squeeze the trigger. And right when I squeeze the trigger, a bullet ricochets off my helmet and beds in the ground underneath me. And all I said then was, I'm dead. How you can't process through all that chaos simple things. So I rolled out of the way. The pain never came. Like, okay, I had to do it again. Because I'm not going to now go, hey, how's everything going? So I had to do it again was the most fearful thing I've ever done. But what I had to do was a simple thing that I've been trained to do, like y'all have been trained to do it. Just do it. And that, boy, my heart doesn't race for me when shooting until everything slows down. So I, I rolled out there, saw it again, it didn't process what I was seeing, shot two more rounds really quickly, and then all of a sudden the visual field came up and there was blood all over the rocks behind him. Which my first shot had killed him. But I see the other two rounds, they actually missed, which is scary. But I, now I'm processing and I stand up in the back of the room and I start shaking. I'm like, okay, now how, the third simple thing, how is all this playing out? I'm stuck. I don't know if I'm the last one or not. How is this going to play out? In that moment, one of my snipers falls in front of the window outside, and I went immediately back to one thing I had to do. I had to go get him, which is a defensive thing. I walked out to the door, I'm looking at him, and he's getting shot up pretty bad in my mind. And I thought, you know what, I can't explain this to his wife that I sat here and did nothing. So I broke from cover, grabbed him, pulled him back in, about as big as Tyler. If you think you can pick up a dead Tyler, you can't. So you can watch it on TV like these people, it doesn't happen. It's a bag of, 200 pound bag of jello. It doesn't wanna, so I'm trying to pick him up. I fall down on top of him, pull him into the room and he's unconscious and I'm thinking he's dead and I'm patting him down. And he, my head's about this far away, and he opens his eyes, and what do you think he says? I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> Same I'm like, thing. dude, you are not dead. His words, everybody, he goes, dude, use the F word a bunch of times. He said, we're dead, man. They're everywhere. I'm like, where are they? They're in the compound. Where's your gun? It's blown up. And he couldn't process anything. I said, uh, um, hey, you and I are going to fight till we're dead. You understand? He goes, I don't have a gun. I had another gun in the room just happened to be there. I gave it to him and all the blood came rushing back into his head. He goes, okay, we can do this. So I said, hey, don't leave me and I won't leave you. Let's go out there and see where the guys are. So we ran out there, dust everywhere, bullets everywhere. And I look over and he falls, then I fall. And he gets up and I get up and I'm like, I don't know why we're falling. We go to this other room in the compound and jump in. He goes in low and I go in high. And all we're doing is simple, that's just running. There's nothing complex about it. We go find our guys. 
So the six guys are tucked into the room. What are they saying? We're dead. We're dead. We're, uh, there's nothing we can do. And I said, here's the deal, guys. You two are going to get all their grenades in a bag and throw them over the wall. And they're like, okay. You two get all the 40 millimeter. And you're going to shoot them over the wall. Okay. They couldn't process simple shit until somebody has to come in and go, okay, if we're all going to die, let's do something in the process of it. And then meanwhile, one of the other snipers had, had thought was dead, had fallen off when the explosion, when the other sniper fell in, he fell off an 18-foot wall. He comes walking in nonchalantly, covered in blood, with a knife in his hand. I'm like, Mike, are you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm okay. I'm like, do you have a knife in your hand? Yeah, I killed two Taliban. How did you climb that wall? He goes, I have no idea. I said, are you hit? He goes, I don't know. So I patted him down. I had to wrap something around the knife because it was in his hand and I was getting in his face. Yeah. You know, and he said, uh, they're everywhere. I'm like, do you have a gun? He goes, nope. So I pulled out my pistol and gave it to him and he shakingly dropped his knife and grabbed the gun and he went calm. He goes, okay, what are we gonna do? He said, you and I and the warrant are gonna run out and shoot all the, the mortars out of the tube. He goes, okay. So I had a machine gun guy move out first and he starts shooting, which means he's seeing somebody. My guys with grenades came out and started tossing grenades over the wall. The 40 millimeter guys came out, all they had to do was shoot, shoot grenades. Mike and I and my warrant officer went and dropped 68 mortar rounds and all of a sudden, we're all out of everything all at the same time. And we looked at each other going, what are we going to do? Meanwhile, a B-1 bomber checks on and tells us he has a 2,000-pound bomb. And I said, all right, guys, you understand what we have to do? They're like, do it. So I had to drop a bomb on our position because they were within 10 feet of the door. There was, at that point, 32 Taliban left within... 300 yards total, but 10 guys were outside of the door, and we didn't have any ammo left. So the B-1 bomber launches. How does he laugh about that? He's like, because <laughs> I made it, I survived. <laughs> so he, they uh, uh, dropped the bomb. We all survived, killed all the Taliban, and by just doing simple, non-complicated, nothing, just simple, simple things which is the whole society right now, is not doing anything simple. They've complicated everything, and they're isolated from each other. And I knew that not to isolate those guys. My job was to find them, bring them into the fray, and do something with them until the, the shit was over. And that's all I did. And thank God we survived. By the grace of God, because it wasn't because we were good at what we were doing. It's probably because we kept moving and didn't get locked down. Action. God. You heard me say that um, Edward Everett Hale quote, which has been our mantra for the last two weeks, is I am only one, but still, you I can am do, one. You, one person can change everything all the time. And it's the simple things that are so vital. And I now break everything down into three things. The, what I call the non-negotiable things, time derivative. I have to do three things a day for my health, a main workout, a stretch, and hydrate. That's simple. If you do that, you win. Nobody does it. I'm not gonna do anything today. I spend 10 minutes in the morning uh, doing spiritual things divided into three things. And then I guarantee every day I have to do, in business, one offensive hour where I'm reaching out to new clients that I've never met through whatever freaking means I can have at my disposal. And then I spend an hour dealing with existing clients. That's defensive. That's defensive. Then I spend an hour with no constraints thinking about where this is gonna play out. I don't worry about how things went with the clients or how things went with I don't care about what society's doing. Where do I want to be? Where do I want my family to be or my business to be? Ideally, I don't mm -hmm. care about the environment. So those three hours 
are non-negotiable and it doesn't matter if there's a crisis. You can do those three things in a crisis. That's right. But is anybody doing them? Yeah. So I'm going to forego my business and sit and watch TV and listen to this person tell me there's an existential crisis while I've spent my three hours watching TV. Okay, there's a crisis. Get on the phone. If everybody's in a crisis, then you know where your target is. That's right. And all your people are home now. Oh my gosh, you've pinned the target down. We know exactly where they are. Yeah. They're not at work. Deal with it. Deal with the, it. It's, Joe and I talk about this off. I can. When you make it through this in June, the next year is going to be the biggest year in the history of mankind. Yes, sir. Some people won't make it, guarantee. Some people will fall. But billionaires are made from June 2020 to 2021, guaranteed. Guaranteed. The ones that make everything simple. Damn. The amount of intimacy that your clients are going to demand of you in June, they're going to come out of jail and want some. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's how I look at it. Absolutely, man. And that's the way that we're looking at it. Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. That except was complex. That, <laughs> that, was, that was unbelievable. Thank you for... Uh, for being open and vulnerable and sharing that story and talking about the three simple things because that's those actions are what is going to set every single person up to win, to absolutely dominate. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of the My Living Legacy vlog. And if you are anything like I was after watching Tom tell that incredible, just unfathomable story. You're probably a little bit in shock, a little in awe, uh, but hopefully you are inspired. Hopefully you got some tactical things out of that story that you can use during this chaotic time. That was my hope in putting this episode together. And guys, as always, if there's anything that I can do uh, to be of service to you during this difficult time and any time, please don't hesitate to reach out to me with a DM on Instagram, a Facebook message, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be more than happy to do all that I can to support you with what we're all going through together.